4.30 in the morning and we've been already driving for 30 minutes to see the rocket lounge, yay! It's one hour and 30 minutes from Millennia area and one hour from Orlando downtown. I'm so excited to see it because the rock lounge is at 6.30, 6.36 to be precise. And it's supposed to be a historic Boeing NASA Atlas V rocket lounge. So I'm so excited. The only problem is that the Kennedy Space Center is gonna be open only at 9 a.m. and I'll have to wait outside just on the bench. So I'll have some time to talk to you guys and let's get going. I don't know what to say now. Did you know that at this particular moment there are only six people in space? Just six. It's like six of me or you well, you know what I mean? I can't imagine that it's just so limited and so special that it's only six people in space right now. By the way, we arrived on the space station. Behind me you can see rocket that is about to launch. I'm just kidding, come on. They're not gonna let us that close to the rocket. I think it's gonna be somewhere behind me like in the woods, seven miles away. And I thought I'm gonna be right on the platform of the lounge station, but uh, you know, mm, I'm so naive. Four, three, two, one. And here it comes, the rocket lounge, whoa! Whoa, can you hear the sound? Oh my god, I couldn't hear it until now. Ten seconds of delay. Why? Because the speed of a sound? Can you see it go not in a straight line? That's because they're trying to um, use less fuel, so they're trying to go with the, the gravity layers. So that's why they turn the rocket a little bit. That's a rocket in a space. It goes around the orbit. Wow. Wow. Did we already cross the line? Possibly overrated. Haven't seen you around before. This one was used to launch the first human to the space, not Gagarin. I'm in US, so the first one from US. And this rocket was used to orbit Earth three times for the first time. So exploring the speed and the gravity and the force to lead to landing on the moon. That's why it was used for orbiting the Earth. Also, the lounge that I was looking at in the morning, its mission was to test the new rocket that can launch people into the space. So far, the only country that can do so is Russia. <laughs> because US can only launch satellites and the cargo into the space and if they want to launch their people, they have to fly to Kazakhstan. And they're trying to do it by themselves until 2011 because all of their shuttles were unsuccessful. They were rendered too expensive to actually launch it so it's more cost efficient to go to Russia to ask them to launch people anywhere in the world actually not only Americans and so since 2011 today was the historic launch where they checked if they can do so with their equipment with NASA equipment today it was uncrewed so it was only cargo 
but we were just notified as a live update like the most recent and it's 10 a.m. Uh, they're having some glitches on the orbit. The whole mission has to go through successfully for eight days but in two days we will know if it will reach the station or not. If it will reach the station then the next launch will be already with people and it will reduce dependency on Russia in terms of carrying people into the space. So US will be able to do so and other countries will ask this huge capitalistic country to do it. I'm about to meet the real astronaut and I want to ask him a question. What is the first thing that you think about when you lift off and the last thing you think about when you land on Earth? What is the most important lesson that you've learned during your first journey to space? But we'll see how talkative they will be. And then, as a senior in med school, just four months before I graduated, I came home from Southwestern, which is in Dallas, Texas, from my med school, one evening, and she said to me, I heard on radio today that NASA's taken an application for astronaut again, they hadn't taken a new group in over nine years. And when I said, I've got to send off an application, she said, I already did. <laughs> and flipped the switch and had a camera on that satellite snap. A self stick that could take pictures of Earth, of cosmos. Do you think selfie was a new invention? It was not. 1983. I can just look out the window because he realized that I had not stopped working. And I'm looking down and there is a meteorite that's burning up into the Earth's atmosphere. And I thought, that's neat. And then I realized, I'm looking down at that. So <laughs> some of the meats are actually, they irradiate them to kill any bacteria. And so they won't spoil and give up and peel open the package and, and eat them. Capsule, before you get to the Mir space station, and on that, they don't have galleys and a lot of food. So they actually did have some of the old toothpaste, the toothpaste tube foods that you used to see, which the shuttle didn't have, but the Russians still had it on their Soyuz. This is the Space Launch System Launcher. It's sitting on the top of the crawlers, weighing 7.7 .7 million kilograms, making the slow 10 hour journey to the launch pad with a speed of just one mile per hour. It usually carries the rocket, but on the video it comes back from the lounge and they have to assemble the rocket on the top of it. It also provides power, communication and fuel to the rocket before it launches. This is the space launch location for Apollo 8. When they try to send a man to the moon after eight times failing to do so. Behind me is Saturn V rocket, like the biggest thing I've ever seen, of course, now that I've seen a lot of rockets. This is the rocket that was used for Apollo missions. Look at how huge their engines are. How powerful is the thrust and how much water do they need to not to get inflamed? That's huge. Like three minutes. So huge. All of the pages over here. Apollo 8, Apollo 11, Apollo 1st was failed attempt to get to the moon because when the astronauts boarded the rocket to do their first training, like in a simulator, right before the boarding, the capsules got on fire and so all three of them died. And then the next one that was crewed in with people was only Apollo 8 because before that they were doing the test flight. So Apollo 8 was successful. That was the first time when people could see the moon so close. They orbited the moon and then they came back until Apollo 11 where, as you know, Neil Armstrong actually touched the moon. Apollo 8 capsule. Spacious enough for a double bed. <laughs> Well, I guess they have to be in a very good relations with each other if three of them had to be there for a period of time. <laughs> it's not as special as I thought, but that's a capsule that was used for Apollo 8 after it was actually detached from this whole the huge structure that was on the ground, and that's what's left in the space. I haven't seen you around before, it's no surprise. This 
part of the rock that's where all the oxygen holds to actually lift it off the ground. That's where the computer system is and right at front is usually where people are and plus protective system. It's right on the like on the cone of it. And at the end is of course the huge intricate engine system which also consists of uh, oxygen and fuel and then both of them mix to create the thrust. Here is presenting the cockpit for Apollo 11. This one is the commodore control and the commodore for this mission was Neil Armstrong. Since the rocket behind me, Saturn V, was equipped with tons of highly explosive material, they had to attach a protective measure. One of these two parts, so it's like it is right near the part of the rocket where passengers sit. This protective measure was employed in case if two or more engines will not generate the thrust. Because if it will happen, then the whole rocket might explode. So in this case, if that will happen during the ignition part or lead off part, or even in the space already, part that is nearby passenger part of the rocket will actually detach from the rest of the rocket and then it will throw off the passenger part of the rocket into the space, into the orbit. So then the astronauts can deploy the parachutes and land safely to the Earth. Oh, surprise. But I just gotta give you up No sacrifices now Remember the astronaut I was just talking to? It was one of three or four members boarded Atlantis So he was the one who successfully completed the mission It will be sent to Cosmos as a regular rocket And then it will come back as a plane like the one it lands Fly the shuttle right now, the simulator from the lead off to the landing. The rocket that was attached to Atlantis mainly fuel tank and two accelerators. This astronaut made me believe in humanity and love again. Um, I asked him one question, what was the lesson that he learned or something that he came back with after his first ever time in Cosmos? Music actually helps me out a lot. He told me that uh, of course it was the great achievement for him in terms of his development because he told his classmates way back in high school that he wants to be the greatest engineer, scientist and astronaut and well he made it to Cosmos. But the most important thing he said is that if he would face a trade-off, he would trade off being an astronaut for never ever being married to his wife. And um, he would rather be being married to his wife rather than being an astronaut. And that was impressive. Uh, because he also started with that. He started his presentation with a picture of him and his wife and saying that without her, he wouldn't make it. So, that's something to think about and to believe in. <laughs> Next time I'm gonna be talking about space, we'll be in space. I believe in you, Elon Musk. <laughs>